frustration on the faces of lawmakers as the House Speaker stalemate adjourns for the night again as Republican McCarthy continues to fail to reach the 218 votes needed to become Speaker. What happens next? We have you covered. The arrest affidavit cites Brian Koberger's DNA was on a knife sheath found at the scene that he was spotted by a surviving roommate and his trips near the home where four Idaho college students were murdered a dozen times before their death. The chilling new evidence investigators say they have against the suspect. Improvement for Buffalo Bills player DeMar Hamlin, who suffered cardiac arrest on the field, what doctors say was his first question after he woke up. Cries for justice. An Ohio mother says the man who killed her 13-year-old son is not being held accountable. Our conversation with her tonight and why murder charges were dismissed in this case for now. Because if my son was white, once again, I wouldn't be in a situation right now. Matter of fact, if my son was white, Craig probably would never killed him. Royal brawl between brothers. New details from Prince Harry's memoir, calling Prince William his beloved brother and arch nemesis. There has always been this competition between us, weirdly. I think it really plays into or played by the air spare. From the power of the Black Panther movie series to saying goodbye to Chadwick, a sit down with the star of one of the highest grossing movies of 2022, Wakanda Forever, to talk about the iconic films and finding his way after losing his mother. You know, I'm, I lost my mom two months ago and Within a week, I was on tour promoting a movie. And no one had the full expectation of me to be there, but I did have that expectation of myself. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. It is a busy Thursday night as we come on the air. Feels like Groundhog's Day once again. After five failed votes, the House has voted to adjourn for the night without a new speaker. Much more on that in a moment. But we do begin tonight with stunning new details in the brutal killing of four college students in Idaho. Those details come from a new affidavit unveiled for the arrest of suspect Brian Koberger, who late last night arrived in Idaho after being taken into custody in Pennsylvania. Koberger was seen walking into court today prior to appearing before a judge in Idaho for the first time to face murder charges. Authorities revealed how they were able to link him to the crime in part from DNA found on a knife sheath at the scene. And tonight we are getting a chilling account from a roommate who was not injured and survived. She said that she saw a masked man right in their home on the night her four friends died. What we still don't know tonight is why police were not contacted for about eight hours. Kana Whitworth leads us off from Idaho. Brian Koberger greeting his attorney with a smile today in his first appearance in an Idaho courtroom, then nodding along as the judge read the charges against him one by one. Count two alleges that you committed the felony offense of murder in the first degree. The maximum penalty for that offense if you plead guilty or are found guilty is death and or imprisonment for life. Do you understand? Yes. It comes as authorities unsealed an explosive 18-page affidavit laying out the evidence used to arrest Koberger for the murders of four University of Idaho students. Investigators recovering DNA from an empty sheath for a military-style knife. It was found next to the bodies of best friends Kaylee Gonzalez and Madison Mogan. Police later linking that DNA to Koberger by collecting his father's DNA from trash outside the family home and linking it to their sample from the crime scene. Did anybody do their chores today? The close group of friends seen inside their home just weeks before the murders. And for the first time, we're hearing the chilling account from one of two roommates who survived. She was on the same floor as two of the victims who were killed, Zana Kernadel and Ethan Chapin, telling police she was woken by a noise at 4 a.m., hearing Kaylee say something like, there's someone here. Then she heard crying from Zana's room, followed by a male voice saying, it's okay. I'm going to help you. She opened her door and stood frozen as a man wearing black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. Describing him as 5'10 or taller, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. The man left out the sliding glass door. Authorities say that roommate was in shock. What they don't explain is why it took another eight hours for police to get a 911 call from the house. 
Police believe Koberger turned his phone off during the murders at 2.47 a.m. The phone dropping off the cell network near his home in Pullman, Washington, and reconnecting at 4.48 a.m. near the crime scene. Police mapping out his likely route to the house. They say cell phone data also shows Koberger was near the victim's home at least a dozen times before the murders and the morning after. We have uh, um, information of a white vehicle that was in the area. By the time police turned to the public for help finding a white Elantra, Koberger was already on police radar. An officer at Washington State found his car and noted he had bushy eyebrows, matching the description of the murder suspect. Five days after the murders, Koberger changed his license plate from Pennsylvania to Washington when his car's registration was due for renewal. You can see that new plate during those two traffic stops in Indiana when Koberger was pulled over on his 2,500-mile drive back to Pennsylvania. Let's get right to Kena Whitworth, who joins us now from Moscow, Idaho. Kena, have authorities said whether the suspect knew anyone inside the house? Right, Lindsay, that was information we thought we would see in that affidavit. At this point, authorities say, you know what, now that they have their suspect, their investigation into motive and connection has really just begun. And we also learned from that affidavit that the suspect's phone was pinged near the victim's home several times in the weeks before the murders. What do you know about that? That's an incredibly important investigative tool for authorities right now, and that is, again, something that they will use to build their case and draw those possible connections, Lindsay. All right, Kana Whitworth for us once again. Thanks so much, Kana. Now let's go to Washington, where the House stands adjourned until noon tomorrow after not one or two, but five failed votes for Speaker. Let's take a live look at the Capitol now, where while some members have gone home for the night, Kevin McCarthy and his allies likely burning the midnight oil, trying to convince those so-called never McCarthy Republicans to change their vote. Could this extend well past tomorrow? Our congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, put that very question directly to Kevin McCarthy and filed this report. Peter McCarthy, do you have any updates? Today, Kevin McCarthy making new and major concessions to the hardline conservatives who were blocking him from becoming the Speaker of the House. McCarthy even offering to change the House rules so one single lawmaker could force a vote to remove a Speaker. Still, none of the 20 rebels changed their minds today or their votes. You never have to ask me again if I'm a no on Kevin McCarthy. I will never vote for Kevin McCarthy. 11 times Congress has voted and 11 times McCarthy has failed to get the support he needs. Not been has not been. A speaker has not been elected. The last time a speaker's race went beyond nine ballots, 1859. McCarthy's allies frustrated. We're still stuck at the starting block. The American people have told us by putting a Republican majority here that they want Republicans to lead and they want a government that works and doesn't embarrass them. And we are failing on both missions. McCarthy is hoping caving to key demands from the rebel holdouts will get him the votes he needs. Do you think the concessions are enough at this point? I think we're having good uh, discussions. I think everybody wants to find a solution. And the good thing about it is we worked this all out at the beginning, so the rest of the Congress will be very productive for the American public. But some of McCarthy's supporters say he's giving away too much. We cannot allow a small group of folks commit political terrorism, and that's what they're doing. Regardless, McCarthy has not gained any new support. It is not happening. And as it's been said, we need to get to a point where we start evaluating what life after Kevin McCarthy looks like. Some harsh words there. Rachel Scott joins us from Capitol Hill on another long night in Washington. Rachel, you just caught up with Republican leader Kevin McCarthy. Let's just take a listen to what he had to say. Do you think How long do you think this is going to drag out for at this point? I'd love to know, but we're working through and we made good progress today, so we'll continue to talk. Did you? McCarthy not backing down there. Give us a sense of what else you gleaned from your conversation. I think one thing is becoming clearer by the day here is that Kevin McCarthy is in this fight. He is not backing down. He's not dropping his bid, even after repeated votes where he is defeated to become the next Speaker of the House. Bottom line, I had multiple opportunities to catch up with McCarthy today. He insists that he will get, get there. Now, sources tell us that they are getting closer to making a deal with some Republicans, but the challenge for McCarthy is he has the small group 
group of conservatives who are standing very firm at this point. They are showing no signs of breaking, and he can only afford to lose four members from his own party. This is just a razor-thin majority in the House, Lindsay. Right, and it sounds like they were saying the same thing last night, yeah. right? That they felt that they were making progress, that they were going to get there. Uh, turns out they didn't. We'll see what happens tomorrow. But also break down for us what happens next tomorrow, now that the House has adjourned for the night. Could this voting continue throughout the weekend? Uh, we, we could see that happen. And I can tell you that I talked to lawmakers today that they're certainly bracing for that. I mean, the notice that went out to all members was to prepare to be in Washington, D.C. until there is a Speaker of the House because, as you know, no other business can go on here. I mean, we do not have a functioning Congress. No members have been sworn in. No bills can come to the floor. Uh, Don Bacon, who you just saw in my piece there, well, he told me today that he doesn't even have a security clearance, that he had to cancel a meeting with the Joint Chiefs because because he does not have a security clearance, that he's getting calls from constituents who are having trouble getting uh, access with, to certain agencies, but they can't even communicate with the agencies because they're not sworn into Congress at this point. One thing also very clear is that McCarthy said that he does not have a timeline in mind, Lindsay, so we're all buckling up here on Capitol Hill. <laughs> That's right. All right, eat your Wheaties, Rachel. You're gonna need <laughs> that longevity. Rachel Scott for us on Capitol Hill, thanks so much. We're joined now by Republican Congressman elect Mike Lawler from New York, who is back to Congressman McCarthy in the speaker's battle. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. So these repeated votes don't seem to be uh, very fruitful at this point. Why do you think that tomorrow might be any different from the past three days? Well, look, uh, you know, the Freedom Caucus thought that Kevin's uh, support would start to fold, uh, and that has not happened. Uh, we have held firm. Uh, as we're going to continue to do throughout this process. And so I feel over the last 24 hours, there's been progress, there's been movement. Uh, the conversations have been positive. Uh, and I believe that we are getting towards uh, a resolution. Uh, but ultimately, as I've said from the very, very beginning, uh, I and many others will not waver in our support of Kevin because you cannot allow a handful of folks within a conference to dictate to the rest of the conference what we're going to do. Otherwise, you don't have a conference. People need to work together. There needs to be trust. Uh, but you have to respect the will of the conference uh, in order to move forward. And, you know, as somebody coming from a Biden district, uh, you know, a district Joe Biden won by 10 points, um, you know, I and others could do exactly what the Freedom Caucus is doing uh, in return. So. That's not how you work together. It's not how you advance the cause. And it's certainly not how you do the business of the American people who asked for and wanted a Republican check and balance on the Biden administration. They wanted a Republican check and balance on the Senate. Uh, and they wanted us to advance our agenda, which would be to rein in wasteful government spending, secure the southern border, increase domestic production of energy. Those are issues that we all ran and won on, and that's exactly what we're going to do as soon as we elect a speaker. So it is critically important that we come together as a conference and move forward, and I think we're making progress on that front. So you said that the conversations have been positive. You think that you're making progress. Is there any inkling that you can share with us that, that leads you to believe that? Because right now it doesn't seem like there, this is an issue about concessions or cutting a deal, that those members who are opposing McCarthy said that they simply don't trust him to do the job and that they won't vote for him. So I'm just wondering how we get there. How is there some positive thought that things are shifting in the right direction? Because as we saw from yesterday today, there was no change. Well, you're referencing three members who have said that. Uh, I think the rest of them, uh, by and large, are negotiating in good faith uh, and are making progress uh, towards an agreement. Uh, many of the rules changes and budgetary changes that have been requested are things that the entire conference would support. So there is a lot of area of agreement. Uh, the objective, though, is to land the plane, obviously, and get Kevin McCarthy elected speaker, not so that Kevin McCarthy is speaker, but so that we can get about the work on behalf of the American people. And Kevin is the only person who is positioned 
to get to the requisite number of votes and have the support of the entire conference. You know, he has the support of a majority of the people in the Freedom Caucus. So this is not an issue of the Freedom Caucus even being against him. It's a handful of members uh, that seem to have a, a, a personal issue with him uh, that they are putting above the American people and above the conference. Uh, and we're just not going to allow that to happen. So we are making progress. We're going to continue uh, across the board to work in good faith towards resolution uh, and ultimately elect a speaker. Are you prepared to potentially stay in Washington through the weekend for continued votes if necessary? Well, with an uh, eight and a half month old down here with me, uh, obviously I'd like to get home sooner than later. But look, I have a job to do, and I'm going to do it uh, until uh, we get a resolution. Uh, so if it requires me being down here through the weekend uh, and through next week, uh, that's what I will do. Congressman elect Mike Lawler of New York, we thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and insight. Thank you. Switching gears now after what's been an incredibly difficult week in the sports world for the Buffalo Bills, the NFL, and many fans, we have a bit of good news to report on hospitalized Bills safety, Damar Hamlin. Doctors say that Hamlin has shown remarkable improvement and his neurological function appears to be intact. We are also learning what he first asked doctors when he woke up and what they told him. Alex Perez reports for us once again from Cincinnati. Tonight, a remarkable turnaround for DeMar Hamlin, defying odds, now awake and able to write after suffering that terrifying cardiac arrest during Monday Night Football. One of the first questions he asked doctors in writing, who won the game? When he asked, did we win, the answer is yes, you know, DeMar, you won, you've won the game of life. Doctors delivering the extraordinary details of Hamlin's recovery, the turning point coming late Wednesday night. The 24-year-old not only waking up, but able to move his hands and feet. And key, doctors say, he seems to have no neurological issues. It's not only that the lights are on, we know that he's home, uh, and that it appears that all, all the cylinders are firing. Uh, what's in his brain. Hamlin collapsed on the field after this tackle during the first quarter against the Cincinnati Bengals. Today, doctors revealing those first medics on the field started the process of reviving Hamlin less than one minute after his heart stopped. That swift action likely saving Hamlin's life. He remains in the ICU, breathing with the help of a ventilator. Late today, the Bills taking to the field for practice. Head coach Sean McDermott emotional. It's amazing to to know the impact that this has had. Bills quarterback Josh Allen holding back tears, describing the moment his teammate went down. Being on that field, <clears throat> you, you, you lose sleep, you hurt for your brother. The scene just replays over and over in your head. It's something we'll never forget. McDermott saying Hamlin's father addressed the team Wednesday, urging them to play for DeMar. His message was the team needs to get back to um, focusing on the goals that they had set for themselves. DeMar would have wanted it that way. Alex Perez joins us from Cincinnati once again tonight. And Alex, it's certainly nice to be talking about what appears to be some very promising news for Hamlin. It, what comes next for him in the ICU? Yeah, Lindsay, this is truly remarkable. Doctors say the next immediate goal is to gradually get him off of that ventilator and breathing on his own and eventually get him strong enough to go home. His team says they will be taking the field this Sunday and they'll be playing for him. Lindsay? You can imagine in his honor. Alex Perez, our thanks to you. President Biden today announced new efforts to tackle our nation's immigration crisis by broadening an existing program to allow migrants from certain countries to stay. The news is getting some mixed reviews from both sides just a week before he heads to Mexico. He's ABC's senior White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. Facing growing political pressure and with 200,000 migrants arriving at the border each month, President Biden today announcing a new crackdown, just days before he plans to visit the border for the first time since taking office. This is a hard one to, to deal with, but we have to deal with it. I mean, we, it's, it's, it's who we are. Biden with a blunt message for people seeking asylum from Cuba, Nicaragua, Haiti, and Venezuela who attempt to cross the border illegally. Do not. Do not just show up at the border. Stay where you are and apply legally from there. 
Biden announcing the U.S. will allow up to 30,000 people from those countries to apply for asylum each month, but they would have to meet strict criteria, including naming a sponsor in the U.S. The ACLU blasting Biden's plan, saying it further ties his administration to the poisonous anti-immigrant policies of the Trump era. On the flip side, the Republican governor of Texas calling it nothing more than a Band-Aid. And he says that is still not enough. Mary Bruce joins us now from the White House. Mary, the president finally making that trip to the border. Is the timing of that notable? It certainly is, Lindsay. Look, Republicans have hammered the president for failing to visit the border during his nearly two years in office. And Biden is well aware that immigration is likely to be a big issue in the upcoming presidential race. And now it seems he's trying to get ahead of all of this. He will be down in the border near El Paso on Sunday. He's going to be assessing the enforcement operations down there, meeting with local officials. So the president finally making that trip. But of course, it comes as much of Washington's attention is focused on what's going on on the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue up on the capital. Lindsay. For good reason. All right, Mary Bruce from the White House. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. Now to Mexico and the dramatic capture of the son of imprisoned drug kingpin El Chapo. A video Guzman was taken into custody during a dramatic pre-dawn military operation. Our Matt Rivers is in Mexico City for us tonight. Tonight, the Mexican city of Culiacan turning into a war zone after the capture of Ovidio Guzman, a leader of the Sinaloa cartel and son of infamous drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. Dozens of roadblocks were set up by armed men trying and failing to prevent Guzman from being taken out of the city. Attacks even launched at the airport. Here, military members take cover as a Mexican Air Force plane taxis down the runway. At the same time, at least one bullet striking this Aeromexico commercial flight, civilians forced to hunker down, though none were injured. The attacks reminiscent of 2019, when Guzman was briefly captured in Culiacan by the Mexican military. But cartel gunmen besieged the city, and Mexico's president ordered Guzman released, a poignant reminder of the power wielded by criminal organizations in Mexico. Well, Lindsay, this time those attacks did not work, and Guzman remains in custody tonight here in Mexico City. He is wanted in the United States on charges of trafficking fentanyl and other drugs, and the U.S. has requested his extradition since 2019. All of this comes just days before President Biden's visit here to Mexico City, scheduled for Monday. Lindsay? All right, Matt, thank you. When we come back, the moment two suspected arsonists ended up setting themselves on fire and bombshell new allegations from Prince Harry, including claims that his brother, Prince William, physically assaulted him. The new revelations from his upcoming memoir. The first of mother's calls for justice. An Ohio woman says the man who killed her son is not being held accountable and police dismiss charges against him. We speak with her tonight about why she believes charges have not been refiled and the devastating day she found out her son was killed. GMA Monday morning. Ultimately, I don't think that we can ever have peace with my family unless the truth is out there. Prince Harry. You refer to your brother as your beloved brother and arch nemesis. Strong words. What did you mean by that? The GMA interview. So the heir was jealous of the spare. Everyone will be talking about. Maybe it's a difficult question to ask or for you to answer. I'm sure you're going to ask it anyway. I'm going to ask it anyway. You have to. Good morning, America Monday. I think my niece Allie was pushed off that ledge. And only one person came into an eight-figure sum as a result of her death. If we pull this off, we're set for life. What do you think you're doing? Get out now. Can this be our little secret? They have to pay for what they did. The Watchful Eye, January 30th on Freeform and stream on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. This is a very violent crime scene. Police found a skull in a bucket of cement. We're at a dead end. So law enforcement turned to the public. Holy crap. My motto is go big or go home. Web of death. Only on Hulu.
With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Ready for a good show? I'm Phil Gucci. The fireworks by Gucci. No matter how big, no matter how small, it is dangerous. It's not a paycheck, it's our life. Take a look at this dramatic surveillance video showing two suspected arsonists. One of them can be seen dousing the outside of the building with an accelerant. Then the other ignites it. The flames quickly spread, setting both men on fire. They then both ran off. Suspect Police are still searching for them. The motive for targeting the business, which provides immigration services, has not yet been determined. Tonight, an Ohio community is demanding answers after 13-year-old Sinze Reed was shot and killed nearly three months ago. The suspected killer has claimed he was acting in self-defense, but Sinze's mother says authorities are not taking the case seriously enough, all while the man who she says killed her son remains free and living right in their neighborhood. An Ohio mom is calling for justice. Months after her teenage son was gunned down, she's demanding police arrest the man she believes killed him. I was never supposed to be playing a funeral for my 13-year-old baby. Sinze Reed was shot back in October outside an apartment complex in Columbus, Ohio. Police say a witness saw 36-year-old Craig Butler drive by, exit his truck, fire shots at Reed, and then drive off. Butler was arrested days after the shooting and charged with murder, but those charges were dismissed a few days later after prosecutors say he claimed self-defense. Police say they continue to investigate. In Ohio, the self-defense law changed, and the legal part of that is the burden changed. Previously, if a shooter said, I shot someone in self-defense, they had to prove it was self-defense. Now that the law has changed, it changes that burden and shifts it to the prosecution. So that's a much higher burden for the prosecution to have to meet. The charges have so far not been refiled, and instead of being held on bond pending an investigation, today Butler remains a free man, able to walk the streets in a community still searching for answers. I wish I could see him and hold him again. Loved ones of Reed, including his mother, Megan, held a community press conference on New Year's Day, asking police to hold Reed's killer accountable. And we demand real tangible answers and actions. In a statement to ABC News, the Franklin County Prosecutor's Office said the Craig Butler case is under review for potential presentation to the grand jury as evidence is gathered and reviewed. Because this is an active case, we cannot comment further at this time. These laws are designed to protect the shooter, not the victim. And that's the problem with these sort of complete defenses and these staying your ground laws, is it really is designed to sh protect shooters as opposed to victims. Columbus police tell ABC News their investigation is far from over and have promised transparency. This family deserves more than that. Our community deserves more than that. The time is not now, the time was yesterday. It's been three months. Law enforcement officials have not confirmed whether Butler and Reed knew each other or what may have led to the gunfire. Joining us now is Sinze Reed's mother, Megan Reed, and community activist Dewan Sharp. Thank you both so much for your time and, and joining us tonight. Megan, just want to start off by saying uh, our deepest condolences go out to you for the loss of your son, which I, I cannot imagine uh, the pain that you continue to feel. <laughs> It's been nearly three months since your son was killed. Just take us back to October 12th, if you will. What was your son doing that day? How did you learn about what happened? Um, that day he woke up. He told me that he wasn't feeling good. Um, he went back in his room. I was cooking, so I went in the kitchen. Uh, I didn't even know he went outside that day. Like, less than 10 minutes later, the neighbors came banging on the door saying that since they got shot, and they took Suze to the hospital. And they told me that he was shot in the chest, which only thought at that time he was shot in the chest. 
they told me that they was trying to get his heart to restart for 20 minutes. And then they came back and got me, my mom, my two sisters. We went in there. So, as soon as we went in, they, they called Tom and then, and that was at 626. Dewan, Columbus police are investigating, but they say that they are still waiting for key ballistic evidence nearly three months later. It, why do you think that mm -hmm. it's taken this long? I really don't know. Like, I know I received a paper from the corner saying that it does take, like, two or more months. But um, as far as I know right now that my son got sh shot four times that I know of, once in his um, chest, once in his right hand, his right hand's with his right with and two times on the side. So even if Craig is trying to play self-defense, he shot my son in his right hand for sure. So that means my son had his hands up. So he should still be in jail to this day, but he's not, he's walking around a free man. Dewan, question for you. There are some people on social media who are making a parallel between uh, Sinze's death and the death of Ahmaud Arbery that's taking, in that scenario, it took months uh, for arrest to be made. Uh, do you think that that's a fair comparison? I do believe it's a fair comparison, but we can't really do comparison right now. We're, we're just focused on the law right now. Uh, Craig Butler, he was the one that was not allowed to have firearms. Craig Butler was the one that uh, opened fire in the school zone that almost hit multiple people. Mm -hmm. uh, Craig Butler was the one that fled the scene. Craig Butler was the one that had to get apprehended by SWAT. And it had changed off of his self-defense. When we have people in the community from us just coming out here talking to people, we found witnesses that seen it, that said since they didn't have a gun, that Craig had the gun. And the police is investigating, but they're really investigating us because after we had our rally, SWAT team hit uh, their neighbor just looking for a gun that they did not find. There had never been a gun. And we don't understand why Sensei is being tried, but being tried. And he didn't do anything wrong. He was just 13, but a convicted criminal with the with, with the uh, legal firearm firing. When we do have new gun laws here in Ohio, uh, we're supposed to have enhancers. Uh, Craig should have just seen 10 years alone just for having the gun. And so just to confirm, no one has ever said that Sensei had a gun, correct? No one, has, no one has said he had a gun. We got the original police report from uh, which they released to the media uh, when that happened. Uh, no gun. Uh, the city used Sensei's name and likeness when they thought it was black on black crime. But when they found out it was Craig that killed him, it was been complete silence. He hasn't heard from anyone from any type of uh, policy. I'm, I'm just a community activist. I came over here to make sure that uh, she was okay from her losing her, her son. It, Megan, it, Craig Butler, as we've just been discussing, is, is currently a free man. From your perspective as a mother, how difficult is it to know that the man who's accused of allegedly killing your son, that, that he's walking free, living still in the, the community? I'm very frustrated because I know if it was the other way around, if Craig was a black man and my child was white, that black man would be in jail and my son would have justice. Or if since they would kill Craig, my 13-year-old son would still be in jail. And the fact that he's just walking around living his life want to go see his 10 kids in the same neighborhood right yeah here. he lives yeah. right we can look out the window and, and see their home yeah if police and authorities in columbus are watching our report tonight megan what is your message to the police i need justice for my son my son is no longer here i'm going to continue to talk and i will be his voice until he gets justice we have demands for that mm -hmm. first off we would like the immediate arrest of craig butler that's it, like for real. And number two is Gary Tyak in his office. We would like them replaced because uh, they're not doing their job. The third is a apology from the city from for us having to come out here and do this when it's their duty and their elected official capacity to do things, do things for us. And the final one is the DOJ to come into Columbus, Ohio to investigate the patterns of practice of the Columbus Police Department and our judiciary. Well, what have police said to you? How are they defending that they have not arrested him at this point? Silence. Yeah. I haven't even talked to the detective on K-6 October 23rd when he called interrogate me, asking me why do I allow my child 
well, since then, to carry a gun. Like, first of all, why would I allow my 13-year-old son to carry a gun? Like, that doesn't make sense. And why are you interrogating me? My son is the victim. I don't know what happened that day. I wasn't over there. Megan, we did not have uh, the opportunity to ever meet your son. <laughs> Talk to us about what Sensei was like, what, what made him smile, what he loved to do. Um, so they just turned 13, two months before this happened. He was a normal boy. Like, he had friends. He went outside to play. He did a normal boy stuff. And for them to, like, try to make him out to seem like he's in some kind of gang banger in a, in a gang, stealing people's cars, doing all this other nonsense because he's black. That's what it comes out to because he's black. It, it makes me mad, like, really mad. Because if my son was white, once again, I wouldn't be in a situation right now. Matter of fact, if my son was white, Craig probably would have never killed him. Megan and Dewan, we thank you so much for your time. Uh, once again, you have our deepest condolences, and, and uh, we will continue following this case. We appreciate everything that you're doing. And justice for Sensei, justice for everybody out there. Yeah. Still ahead here on Prime, who police say is responsible for the deaths of a family of eight, including five children. Why students in a southern city are now being forced to take classes virtually. The car dealerships are moving fewer vehicles off their lots. We take a look at the declining U.S. auto sales by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from a still recovering Jeremy Renner, marking what he's calling a great ICU day with his mother and sister as he continues to heal following a snow plowing accident. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic, We're baby. making magic. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. GMA Monday morning. Ultimately, I don't think that we can ever have peace with my family unless the truth is out there. Prince Harry. You refer to your brother as your beloved brother and arch nemesis. Strong words. What did you mean by that? The GMA interview. So the heir was jealous of the spare. Everyone will be talking about. Maybe it's a difficult question to ask or for you to answer. I'm sure you're going to ask it anyway. I'm going to ask it anyway. I have to. Good Morning America Monday. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. This is a very violent crime scene. Police found a skull in a bucket of cement. We're at a dead end. So law enforcement turned to the public. Holy crap. My motto is go big or go home. Web of death. Only on Hulu. For making ABC's This Week, America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Welcome back, everyone. U.S. auto sales took a downturn in 2022 and posted their worst year in more than a decade. Let's take a look by the numbers. U.S. car, truck, and SUV sales totaled 13.7 million vehicles last year. That's the lowest amount since 2011 and down 8% from 2021 as supply chain problems put a dent in sales. More than 17 million vehicles have been sold each year for the five years before the pandemic hit in 2020 when a shortage of computer chips and other parts slowed production and inventory. The supply 
supply crunch is easing somewhat, and analysts expect sales to grow by about 1 million vehicles in 2023. With demand still high, the average new vehicle price rose to a record of just over $46,000 per vehicle in December, but prices are expected to improve for some vehicles at least in the coming year. While overall sales were down, General Motors saw full-year sales increase 2.5% in 2022 as it recovered from factory shutdowns and parts shortages. That let GM take back the 2022 sales crown from Toyota, which saw its sales fall 9.6% last year. The biggest drop came for Honda, whose sales slumped nearly 33% in 2022. Meanwhile, electric vehicles remained the fastest growing segment, with sales up nearly 65% from 2021, totaling some 807,000 vehicles sold in the U.S. last year. But they still account for only about 6% of total U.S. sales, even as automakers invest billions on new models. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. A 19-year-old is accused of pretending to be a cop and even pulling over people for traffic stops. How real officers ultimately caught up with him. And those shocking new allegations from Prince Harry's new memoir about the royal family and his decision to leave. Plus, the painful condition singer Adele says is making it difficult for her to perform. First, look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. happening these days it's hard to keep up things change hour by hour minute by minute the historic weather that's now unfolding the worries on wall street we're bringing you the right now at a nationwide teacher shortage the right now look at the day ahead an alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories world news now and america this morning america's number one early morning news today does feel a little different early mornings on abc news live This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. Monday morning. Ultimately, I don't think that we can ever have peace with my family unless the truth is out there. Prince Harry. You refer to your brother as your beloved brother and arch nemesis. Strong words. What did you mean by that? The GMA interview. So the heir was jealous of the spare. Everyone will be talking about. Maybe it's a difficult question to ask or for you to answer. I'm sure you're going to ask it anyway. I'm going to ask it anyway. I have to. Good Morning America Monday. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The House ended a third day of voting, still unable to elect a new speaker. Republican leader Kevin McCarthy has now lost 11 rounds of voting, falling short of the 218-vote threshold he needs as a group of 20 of his colleagues continue to hold out. Negotiations between McCarthy and the group have been ongoing. ABC News has learned some of the concessions McCarthy has made to the so-called rebel Republicans include offering to change the House rules to allow just one lawmaker to force a vote to remove him as Speaker. He has also agreed to put more far-right Republicans on the powerful House Rules Committee and bring bills on term limits and border security up for a vote. 
Following a funeral service in St. Peter's Square, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI's coffin was transported through the basilica to the crypts below the Vatican, his final resting place, the first crypt of John Paul II, which was vacated when John Paul II became a saint and was moved to a chapel inside the basilica. Before his death, Benedict had requested a simple ceremony, his successor, Pope Francis, celebrating the funeral mass, the first time in modern history a current pope eulogized a retired pope. When Pope John Paul II died, there were more than a million people, but Benedict had withdrawn from the public after he resigned and the crowds were much smaller. An estimated 50,000 people gathered to pay the respects. An ongoing water crisis in Jackson, Mississippi has forced its public schools to go virtual. Jackson Public Schools officials say 22 schools in the district are reporting low or no water pressure, leading to the decision to start the new semester with remote learning. It comes after cold temperatures over the Christmas holiday damaged the city's water system. The school district said it would continue to evaluate the school's water supply to determine when to go back to in-person learning. Officials are investigating the deaths of eight family members inside a Utah home. The bodies were found Wednesday in Enoch City with apparent gunshot wounds after police conducted a welfare check. Police believe the suspect, identified as Michael Haight, shot and killed everyone in the home, including his wife, mother-in-law, and five children, before taking his own life. Officials confirmed that Haight's wife had recently filed for divorce. The victims ranged in age from 4 to 78 years old. An accused fake cop in trouble with the real police in Oklahoma. The Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office said it believes 19-year-old Jackson Jones of Tennessee pulled over several people by flashing his lights behind them. Deputies ended up pulling him over on New Year's Day and found him wearing a ballistic vest with sheriff across the front. Officials said he was carrying knives, a flashlight, and handcuffs. Jones was charged with impersonating an officer. The county's sheriffs had this warning for drivers. Should anyone come in contact in this situation and you have any second thoughts or, man, maybe I need to check, call 911. Fans expressing concern for Adele after the Easy On Me singer revealed she's suffering from sciatica, severe lower back pain, while she performed over the weekend. The Grammy winner seen in this video obtained by the Daily Star addressing her condition. I have a lot on these days because I have really bad sciatica. Adele has talked about her back pain before, saying in a 2021 interview with The Face, I've been in pain with my back for like half of my life, really. Sciatica affects up to 40% of adults. Pain traveling along the sciatic nerve, starting at the lower back, going down the legs. Some patients can feel numbness or tingling. Others report a shooting pain. Welcome back, everyone. Now to the new allegations in Prince Harry's upcoming memoir, Spare. After books went on sale in Spain, breaking the rules, the British media is now reporting the rift between Prince Harry and his brother, Prince William, turned physical. And we also have an early look at Harry speaking one-on-one -on -one with Good Morning America anchor Michael Strahan. ABC's James Longman has more. Tonight, after Prince Harry's book, Spare, went on sale in Spain by mistake ahead of Tuesday's official release date, the British press is now furiously translating it and printing excerpts. Among most shocking, the two princes reportedly asked their father not to marry Camilla. The Daily Mail also reporting Charles once joked about whether he was really Prince Harry's father. That on one occasion, while visiting patients at a psychiatric hospital, Charles met a patient claiming to be the real Prince of Wales. Charles later allegedly joking to Harry, who knows if I'm even your real father. Harry says it was in poor taste given the false media speculation that his real dad was James Hewitt, with whom Diana admitted to having an affair. But a rift between the brothers is grabbing the most headlines. The Guardian has a detailed account of William getting physical with Harry in 2019, calling Meghan rude, difficult and abrasive. Harry writing, he grabbed me by the collar and knocked me to the floor. Harry sitting down with ABC's Michael Strahan for a forthcoming interview. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I think she would be... I think she would be sad. I think she'd be looking at, looking at it long term to know that there are certain things that we need to go through to be able to heal the relationship. Um, I have felt the presence of my mum more so in the last two years than I have in the last 30. 
Michael Strahan's interview with Prince Harry airs Monday on Good Morning America. And later that night, you can watch an ABC News Live special report on that sit down at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Prince Harry, in his own words, it streams on Hulu the next day. He's best known for his role as M'Baku in the wildly successful Black Panther franchise, but behind the fierce and humorous tribal leader, Winston Duke loves to portray as a man who's deeply committed to his philanthropic work and is candidly speaking about the loss of his mother. I sat down with Duke earlier this week ahead of Wakanda Forever's Disney Plus release. So I'm curious how you guys were able to balance so well Chadwick's passing it seems that in uh, Wakanda Forever, you have the fans, you have the, the, the cast and crew who are really able to, to grieve mm -hmm. his loss, but at the same time still celebrate the future of their franchise. How do you think you were able to, to balance that so well? You know, one thing was they invited us to grieve in our process of work. So they didn't say, leave your, your grief at home. They didn't say, hey, you know, we really need you to just show up and be here. It was bring it to work. And we had a lot of just shorthand in understanding who had the harder time on what day. So if I was having a hard time on any particular day, then I or Letitia would come over and just say, I get it, you know, let's just take a breather. Ryan would wear Chadwick's face on his chain mm. the entire time. Uh, we did things to remember that we're all grieving. It was just remembering and making that a big part of the process. Irreverent in his honor. There is that, that witty banter <laughs> that, that we yeah. discussed earlier yeah, yeah, yeah. with, you know, the bald-headed yeah, demon, yeah, yeah. for yeah. example. Does that just come from you naturally? Is that impromptu? There's a lot of improvisation. I love improving. I love, like, finding. Once I know the character, and this character I know really well. This fishman would be bound before us as we if speak. If your muscle brains were present, they would still be there, choking on their fuzzy adornments. You bald-headed demon. There was a lot of work to build that character, finding uh, M'Baku in the Igbo Nigerian tradition and really finding that man. So once you're on set, you could just forget all the work and just channel whatever comes mm -hmm. through. At this point, he feels natural. I can get back in him, get back in that, that zone and find the humor. Your character initially, M'Baku, it seemed like in the first mm -hmm. Black Panther, he's kind of challenging T'Challa for the throne. Yeah. But then he emerges more of a, as a leader than an adversary. Oh, yeah. How do you feel that the, the, the M'Baku's arc kind of changes over time as we are learning more about him? Well, he, I've always seen him as, if, if he's ever anything, he's an antagonist. Mm. So he'll antagonize the situation for a purpose. So when I first got into the role, I knew it was, I see the world differently, and I have to try to make the world see it my way. The story really helped me keep him still likable. Like, that way he can still be funny, that way he can still have his version of honor. I think it was the highest grossing female-led superhero movie in the United States ever. Yes. And, and so what was it like working with all these powerful superhero women? <laughs> uh, you know, they make the job easier. Mm. Why? Because they show up prepared. Mm. If it's one thing you can trust is that the Nai Guarira, Lupita Nyong'o, Angela Bassett, Letitia, they're all going to show up ready to go. They drive you through the best kind of leadership. Angela Bassett got a standing ovation in her, her big monologue scene in the movie. We know what you whisper. They have lost their protector. Now is our time to strike. The entire set saw her that day. She was in it. She was finding the spontaneity. She was finding the drama. She was finding the humanity. Mm. And then it reminded you, man, this is why I tell stories. Mm -hmm. 
because that's really what it's about. It's about storytelling. You just mentioned humanity. Mm -hmm. And one thing that, that people may not know about you is that you're a global activist, right? Mm -hmm. So beyond just the storytelling, you're actually living that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so tell us about the, the partnership that you have, because now you're an ambassador, mm -hmm. right, with PIH. <laughs> so tell us about, about that role, mm -hmm. if you will, what, what inspired you and, and what you hope to do with it. Well, I'm the ambassador for Partners in Health, which is kind of the OG uh, social medicine organization around the world. So they're in 11 countries. They started in Haiti um, and helped to curve the AIDS epidemic in Haiti in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and it's really about bringing a holistic look to medicine. Mm. For far too long, medicine has been reductive, where we think of medicine as just the hospital and the pharmaceuticals. Medicine is not just the pharmaceutical. It's thinking about the community. It's about their family. It's about their home life. It's what else are their needs, right? So it's really broadening the idea of what medicine can be and saying that medicine is a human right. You know, I'm, I lost my mom two months ago and within a week I was on tour promoting a movie. And no one had the full expectation of me to be there, but I did have that expectation of myself. I'm really proud that I was able to do that. I felt like I honored my mom being there and championing my own narrative, but the expectation of people who are in grief, it's not right in this country. You know, people in this country get two to three days for bereavement. Mm. You know, there's a corporate model in how we look at grief. What is it that inspires you? There's a lot of people they don't necessarily use their platform for good beyond hmm. th them, themselves. I'm inspired by amplifying the voices of the unseen. Um, even as a big black man for a very long time, even I felt reduced and treated reductively, where it's either I'm only sexualized or seen for like my body my mind isn't respected. Mm. And for a long time, that really pushed me into this space of feeling invisible. I'm really attracted to bringing light, you know, the, the light to, to show all those things I just talked about. Our thanks to Winston for sitting down with us. Black Panther Wakanda Forever will begin streaming on Disney Plus February 1st and will be available on DVD and Blu-ray shortly thereafter. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, the scene from Vatican City today with Pope Francis presiding over the solemn funeral service of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI in St. Peter's Square. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Good night. Now we're staying on top of a few things. The deadly recall now forcing Peloton to pay millions in a new settlement. And the chaos continues in the quest to find a new House Speaker. Congressman Kevin McCarthy still dealing with opposition from within his own party as he tries to get the job. Our team coverage continues next. GMA Monday morning. Ultimately, I don't think that we can ever have peace with my family unless the truth is out there. Prince Harry. You refer to your brother as your beloved brother and arch nemesis. Strong words. What did you mean by that? The GMA interview. So the heir was jealous of the spare. Everyone will be talking about. Maybe it's a difficult question to ask or for you to answer. I'm sure you're going to ask it anyway. I'm going to ask it anyway. I have to. Good Morning America Monday. I think my niece Allie was pushed off that ledge. And only one person came into an eight-figure sum as a result of her death. If we pull this off, we're set for life. What do you think you're doing? Get out now. Can this be our little secret? They have to pay for what they did. The Watchful Eye, January 30th on Freeform and stream on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready?
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Ready for a good show? I'm Phil Grucci of Fireworks by Grucci. No matter how big, no matter how small, it is dangerous. It's not a paycheck. Yeah. It's our life. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. President Biden announced new efforts to tackle our nation's immigration crisis by broadening an existing program to admit up to 30,000 migrants per month from Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. The news is getting mixed reviews from both sides just a week before he heads to Mexico. Connecticut State Representative Quentin Williams was killed in a car crash after he was struck by a wrong way driver hours after he was sworn in for his third term. Williams, known as Q, was just 39 years old. Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont called the news of his passing absolutely devastating on Twitter and ordered that state flags be lowered to half staff. Peloton has agreed to pay a $19 million fine as part of a settlement over its treadmill recall. Fitness company recalled its Tread Plus and Tread Tread mills in 2021 following reports of more than a dozen injuries and the death of a child the settlement resolves the charge that peloton knowingly failed to immediately report to consumer product safety commission as required by law peloton said it was pleased to have reached a solution now let's go to Washington, where the House stands adjourned until noon tomorrow after not one or two, but five failed votes for Speaker. Let's take a live look at the Capitol now, where while some members have gone home for the night, Kevin McCarthy and his allies likely burning the midnight oil, trying to convince those so-called never McCarthy Republicans to change their vote. Could this extend well past tomorrow? Our congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, put that very question directly to Kevin McCarthy and filed this report. Peter McCarthy, do you have any updates? Today, Kevin McCarthy making new and major concessions to the hardline conservatives who were blocking him from becoming the Speaker of the House. Peter McCarthy, how do you convince Republicans who just don't trust you? Guys, don't do Everybody don't trust. McCarthy even offering to change the House rules so one single lawmaker could force a vote to remove a Speaker. Still, none of the 20 rebels changed their minds today or their votes. You never have to ask me if, again if I'm a no on Kevin McCarthy. I will never vote for Kevin McCarthy. 11 times Congress has voted and 11 times McCarthy has failed to get the support he needs. Not been, has not been, a speaker has not been elected. The last time a speaker's race went beyond nine ballots, 1859. McCarthy's allies frustrated. We're still stuck at the starting block. The American people have told us by putting a Republican majority here that they want Republicans to lead and they want a government that works and doesn't embarrass them. And we are failing on both missions. McCarthy is hoping caving to key demands from the rebel holdouts will get him the votes he needs. Do you think the concessions are enough at this point? I think we're having good uh, discussions. I think everybody wants to find a solution. And the good thing about it is we worked this all out at the beginning, so the rest of the Congress will be very productive for the American public. But some of McCarthy's supporters say he's giving away too much. We cannot allow a small group of folks commit political terrorism, and that's what they're doing. Regardless, McCarthy has not gained any new support. It is not happening. And as it's been said, we need to get to a point where we start evaluating what life after Kevin McCarthy looks like. The chilling new details in the brutal killing of four college students in Idaho. Those details come from a new affidavit unveiled for the arrest of suspect Brian Koberger, who late last night arrived in Idaho after being taken into custody in Pennsylvania. Authorities revealed how they were able to link him to the crime, in part from DNA found on a knife sheath at the scene. And tonight we're getting a chilling account from a roommate who was not injured, survived. Kana Whitworth reports from Idaho. Brian Koberger greeting his attorney with a smile today in his first appearance in an Idaho courtroom. 
Then nodding along as the judge read the charges against him one by one. Count two alleges that you committed the felony offense of murder in the first degree. The maximum penalty for that offense if you plead guilty or are found guilty is death and or imprisonment for life. Do you understand? Yes. It comes as authorities unsealed an explosive 18-page affidavit laying out the evidence used to arrest Koberger for the murders of four University of Idaho students. Investigators recovering DNA from an empty sheath for a military-style knife. It was found next to the bodies of best friends, Kaylee Gonzalez and Madison Mogan. Police later linking that DNA to Koberger by collecting his father's DNA from trash outside the family home and linking it to their sample from the crime scene. Did anybody do their chores today? The close group of friends seen inside their home just weeks before the murders. And for the first time, we're hearing the chilling account from one of two roommates who survived. She was on the same floor as two of the victims who were killed, Zana Kernadel and Ethan Chapin, telling police she was woken by a noise at 4 a.m., hearing Kaylee say something like, there's someone here. Then she heard crying from Zana's room, followed by a male voice saying, it's okay. I'm going to help you. She opened her door and stood frozen as a man wearing black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. Describing him as 5'10 or taller, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. The man left out the sliding glass door. Authorities say that roommate was in shock. What they don't explain is why it took another eight hours for police to get a 911 call from the house. Police believe Koberger turned his phone off during the murders at 2.47 a.m. The phone dropping off the cell network near his home in Pullman, Washington and reconnecting at 4.48 a.m. near the crime scene. Police mapping out his likely route to the house. They say cell phone data also shows Koberger was near the victim's home at least a dozen times before the murders and the morning after. We have uh, um, information of a white vehicle that was in the area. By the time police turned to the public for help finding a white Elantra, Koberger was already on police radar. An officer at Washington State found his car and noted he had bushy eyebrows, matching the description of the murder suspect. Five days after the murders, Koberger changed his license plate from Pennsylvania to Washington when his car's registration was due for renewal. You can see that new plate during those two traffic stops in Indiana when Koberger was pulled over on his 2,500 mile drive back to Pennsylvania. Our thanks to Kena for that. After what's been an especially difficult week in the sports world for the Buffalo Bills, the NFL, and so many fans, we have a bit of good news to report on hospitalized Bills safety, Damar Hamlin. Doctors say that Hamlin has shown remarkable improvement and his neurological function appears to be intact. We are also learning what he first asked doctors after he woke up and what they told him. Alex Perez reports for us once again from Cincinnati. Tonight, a remarkable turnaround for Damar Hamlin, defying odds, now awake and able to write after suffering that terrifying cardiac arrest during Monday Night Football. One of the first questions he asked doctors in writing, who won the game? When he asked, did we win, the answer is yes, you know, Damar, you won, you've won the game of life. Doctors delivering the extraordinary details of Hamlin's recovery, the turning point coming late Wednesday night. The 24-year-old not only waking up, but able to move his hands and feet. And key, doctors say he seems to have no neurological issues. It's not only that the lights are on, we know that he's home, uh, and that it appears that all, all the cylinders are firing. Uh, with his brain. Hamlin collapsed on the field after this tackle during the first quarter against the Cincinnati Bengals. Today, doctors revealing those first medics on the field started the process of reviving Hamlin less than one minute after his heart stopped. That swift action likely saving Hamlin's life. He remains in the ICU, breathing with the help of a ventilator. Late today, the Bills taking to the field for practice. Head coach Sean McDermott emotional. It's amazing to to know the impact that this has had. Bills quarterback Josh Allen holding back tears, describing the moment his teammate went down. Being on that field, <clears throat> you, know, you, you, you lose sleep, you hurt for your brother. The scene just replays over and over in your head. It's something we'll never forget. McDermott saying Hamlin's father addressed the team Wednesday, 
urging them to play for DeMar. His message was the team needs to get back to um, focusing on the goals that they had set for themselves. DeMar would have wanted it that way. Our thanks to Alex Perez. Next to the new threat after the West is still reeling from that deadly bomb cyclone hurricane force winds, the mountain's 60 mile per hour winds in San Francisco, up to 10 inches more rain still possible. Where will the storm go next? Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us. Hey, Rob. Remarkable stuff, Lindsay. We've seen the wettest 10-day period in San Francisco since 1871 uh, with over 10 inches falling, and there is more coming with these storms that are lining up. Flash flood watches remain up for California. They'll probably be dropped, then reissued for the weekend, and winter storm warnings remain up as well, well into the Intermountain West. It's still snowy tonight in parts of the Sierra. That'll push over and through I-80 I down into Utah. A bit of a break, but then it looks like late tomorrow night into Saturday, the next batch comes in with four, more flooding rain. But another system, that kind of goes to the East Coast, by the way, but another system coming in Sunday, Monday, that's when the atmospheric river gets set up, another 5 to 10-plus inches potentially in parts of northern and central California. California, that certainly will lead to more in the way of flooding. Lindsay? Oh, some concerning stuff there. Rob Marciano, our thanks to you. Now we head overseas to the Vatican, where tens of thousands paid their final respects to the late Pope Benedict XVI, with Pope Francis leading the funeral services. Our Terry Moran brings us this report. On a chill gray morning in Rome, the pallbearers brought the coffin into St. Peter's Square. Tens of thousands from all over the world gathered to pray and remember and say goodbye to Pope Benedict XVI. Just a few hours before today's mass, a private ceremony, Benedict's body placed into the coffin, hewn from cypress wood, his face gently covered. He had asked for a simple funeral, and it was, barely a mention that he had ever been Pope. Pope Francis presided and delivered the homily. Speaking of the gratitude the church has for Benedict's life, it was the first time in centuries that a pope has laid his predecessor to rest. Benedict's longtime secretary kissing the coffin before mass, and afterwards, Francis with a blessing and a prayer, a fond farewell. Benedict was buried beneath St. Peter's, his cypress coffin placed in a metal one and then an oak one, and buried with him coins and medallions minted during his papacy, as well as a metal cylinder containing a record of his brief but historic reign. Lindsay? Terry, thank you. Still to come, why the arrest of a top drug cartel leader led to a day of violence and unrest in northern Mexico. The man who wrote the book on Harry and Meghan's exit weighs in on Harry's new memoir and on whether the royals will tell their own side of the story. GMA Monday morning. Ultimately, I don't think that we can ever have peace with my family unless the truth is out there. Prince Harry. You refer to your brother as your beloved brother and arch nemesis. Strong words. What did you mean by that? The GMA interview. So the heir was jealous of the spare. Everyone will be talking about. Maybe it's a difficult question to ask or for you to answer. I'm sure you're going to ask anyway. I'm going to ask anyway. You have to. Good Morning America Monday. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. 
Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Violence and disarray in northern Mexico after authorities announced the arrest of El Chapo's son, Ovidio Guzman, a top leader of the Sinaloa cartel. Guzman was captured by Mexican armed forces in an overnight raid. Despite alleged cartel members' efforts to besiege parts of the city and prevent the drug lord's removal by using burning vehicles as roadblocks, officials managed to transport him via military aircrafts to Mexico City. Guzman is wanted on federal charges in the United States and could face extradition to the U.S. pending legal proceedings. The U.S. will provide $30 million in aid to Moldova to help the small country tackle an energy crisis and other economic hardships caused by the Kremlin's unprovoked and unjustified war against Ukraine, a U.S. government aid agency announced. Moldova was one of Europe's poorest countries, landlocked between Ukraine and Romania, began to recover from a series of economic blows, including the COVID-19 pandemic and a fourfold increase in natural gas prices when the war in Ukraine derailed its progress. But look at this anxiety-inducing video of a man being saved after he fell while getting off of a moving train in India. Footage released by the Ministry of Railways shows the passenger falling and being dragged along with his legs dangling in between the moving train and the track. Thankfully, a railway officer was able to pull him clear of the danger. Now to the new allegations in Prince Harry's new memoir, Spare, after books went on sale in Spain, breaking the rules. The British media is now reporting the rift between Prince Harry and his brother Prince William turned physical. And we also have an early look at Harry speaking one-on-one -on -one with GMA anchor Michael Strahan, which airs on Monday. ABC's James Longman has more. Tonight, after Prince Harry's book, Spare, went on sale in Spain by mistake ahead of Tuesday's official release date, the British press is now furiously translating it and printing excerpts. Among the most shocking, the two princes reportedly asked their father not to marry Camilla. The Daily Mail also reporting Charles once joked about whether he was really Prince Harry's father. That on one occasion, while visiting patients at a psychiatric hospital, Charles met a patient claiming to be the real Prince of Wales. Charles later allegedly joking to Harry, who knows if I'm even your real father. Harry says it was in poor taste given the false media speculation that his real dad was James Hewitt, with whom Diana admitted to having an affair. But a rift between the brothers is grabbing the most headlines. The Guardian has a detailed account of William getting physical with Harry in 2019, calling Meghan rude, difficult and abrasive. Harry writing, he grabbed me by the collar and knocked me to the floor. Harry sitting down with ABC's Michael Strahan for a forthcoming interview. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I think she would be... I think she would be sad. I think she'd be looking at, looking at it long term to know that there are certain things that we need to go through to be able to heal the relationship. Um, I have felt the presence of my mum more so in the last two years than I have in the last 30. James Longman joins us now from London. James, has the royal family responded to these allegations? No, Lindsay, that was the policy after the Netflix documentary aired. And once again, uh, neither Buckingham Palace or Kensington Palace are saying anything. Tonight, um, as I'm here now, I'm looking at uh, Twitter and social media. It's lighting up with all these revelations, uh, line after line. And I have to say, a lot of it pretty salacious, all this stuff that's coming out of the Spanish translations, which British journalists are trying desperately to get their hands on. A lot of it quite personal, quite intimate. Harry describes, for example, uh, losing his virginity. A a lot of people in this country are asking why he's decided to give up quite so much uh, information. Uh, I think Harry and Meghan, the whole, the whole reason why they left was to kind of reach this new dignified life outside of Britain. And, pr and Prince Harry, for Prince Harry, it was about leaving his past behind, uh, leaving behind this sort of tabloid gossip about him. This book, what we're hearing about it now anyway, has put him back very much into that world. I don't think Harry and Meghan's camp are going to be happy at all about these uh, revelations that have been put out in their tabloids. For our part, though, here at ABC, Michael's interview with Harry will air on Monday on GMA. Lindsay. All right. Thanks so much for that, James. ABC's royal contributor, Omid Scobie, joins us now to take a deeper dive into all this. Omid, you wrote Finding Freedom about the issues that led Prince Harry and Meghan to leave. So you've known about the rifts in the family for quite some time. Around the time of the alleged fight between Princess Harry and William, what was the dynamic like within the family? <laughs> Well, Lindsay, it was so interesting sort of looking back on those moments where we were covering the story for the book and now being able to hear it from 
the man himself. It's very rare that we get a member of the royal family, a senior one at that, opening up about these really personal moments in the family. But as we've heard in Spare, that rift between the brothers was really at an all-time peak at that time. And what amazes me about that moment is that just how easily it was kept secret up until now. So it does show you that things can be hidden and kept away when, when wanted. And when speaking about things being hidden, had you heard anything about a physical fight before now or any rifts that would make you suspect that something like this would happen? We had definitely heard about moments between the brothers that were incredibly heated and language used by William that was incredibly inflammatory at the time, but never a word about any kind of physical attack. And of course, this was an assault by William on his younger brother. People might want to sort of play it down as sort of sibling rivalry or brothers having a little spat, but actually it was much more serious than that. These are two men well into their 30s. Harry, of course, in his own in own space at home, wanting to have a serious discussion with his brother that, as we saw, really reached a point where even William himself, who, according to Harry, apologised soon after, came to regret. But I think it just shows that wedge that can easily be driven between family members when it comes to work, being working members of the royal family. During the time of your book, what were Meghan and Harry thinking about their future? Was there any consideration from them at that point that they might leave their roles as senior royals? You can go back as far as the wedding itself to those first moments when they started thinking about life outside palace walls. And I think really things hit a serious peak for them in that sort of November, December time of 2018, when they realized that the institution wouldn't be protecting them or defending them from some of the many negative and toxic stories that started being reported about them in the press. This was, of course, a time when Meghan was beginning to be known as Duchess Difficult. And many of the sources behind those stories came from within the palace itself. Harry desperately wanted his wife to be protected and very quickly found out that that wasn't going to happen. What do you make of the allegation that Prince William and Kate Middleton encouraged Harry to wear a Nazi costume, which ended up, of course, setting off a massive firestorm in the media? Harry actually goes into great detail in the book about how he regrets that moment, how he takes full accountability for it. And of course, within that story is also the fact that William and Kate really sort of turned a blind eye to Harry's choice to wear that Nazi uniform in the first place. They almost sort of found it funny. But I think that shows really sort of perhaps the shared level of ignorance within the royal household that we sometimes see. On the one hand, Harry says that he wants to reconcile with his family, but then on the other, he's also done this docu-series, interviews, now this book revealing private and damning details. Do you think that he's making any reconciliation impossible? I think there's many things that he still sees as unfinished business, accountability and apologies being one of them. And I think that those are the things that he's really wanted to gain from doing these documentaries, from speaking in the book, from being so candid. Of course, we've still got interviews with him over the days ahead where more revelations will no doubt come out. It does make it very difficult for the royal family. They do strictly abide by that never complain, never explain mantra. And I think that that's not just in front of the world, that's also behind palace walls as well. They'll hope that this will just disappear, that the book will come and go and the worst will have passed. But I don't think that that will ever see Harry find what he's looking for. And what you just said, the, that old adage from the royals, never complain, never explain. But at what point do the royals start doing their own press and maybe telling their side? or? Do they just stay silent? I think in this case, they're going to be in a really difficult position not to respond to some of the things that come out in this book. Of course, Harry goes into great detail about how members of the family have leaked stories to sort of help themselves in the public eye, often turning to people like Harry, the spare, as collateral damage in the process. And I think these are going to be things that they'll have to address at some point. ABC Royals contributor Omid Scobie, we thank you, as always, for your time and insight. Appreciate it. Michael Strahan's interview with Prince Harry airs Monday on Good Morning America. And later that night, you can watch an ABC News Live special report on that sit down at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Prince Harry, in his own words, it streams on Hulu the next day. And still to come, getting the motivation to hit your 2023 goals can be difficult, but one influencer is helping her millions of followers get on track. We get some tips in this week's TikTok. 
GMA Monday morning. Ultimately, I don't think that we can ever have peace with my family unless the truth is out there. Prince Harry. You refer to your brother as your beloved brother and arch nemesis. Strong words. What did you mean by that? The GMA interview. So the heir was jealous of the spare. Everyone will be talking about. Maybe it's a difficult question to ask or for you to answer. I'm sure you're going to ask anyway. I'm going to ask anyway. I have to. Good Morning America Monday. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. We turn now to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we take a closer look at the story behind the sensation. For many, the start of a new year is a time to set new goals, and one social media influencer is helping her 2.1 million followers do just that by developing a healthier relationship with food. Steph Grasso is known for her grocery shopping list and meal prepping tips, and Steph is inspiring others to reclaim their health. Take a look. All right, new year, new me. I'm going to lose weight this year. That's a good long-term goal. How are you going to do that? I'm going to stop snacking at work and work out every night. Hmm. Why do you think cutting out snacks will help you lose weight? Uh, because I'm eating less food. But taking something away is going against your natural routine. And when you take something away without replacing it, your body is constantly going to think about it. So what should we do? Here with all the answers, joining us now, Steph Grasso. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, improving your mind, body, and soul is a great way to kick off the year. Uh, what are the secrets to building a balanced meal? Oh, man. Well, there are many things you can do to build a balanced meal, but I like to think of it as a formula. So a balanced meal is, or a balanced plate, I like to say, is composed of a carbohydrate, protein, a healthy fat, and I like to throw in some veggies in there because when you have a balanced plate, you feel a lot more satisfied, you feel fuller, and you're less likely to binge on some snacks in the future or in between meals. And most of us are on the go. We don't necessarily have the time or energy to cook meals after a long day of work. What are some nutritious meal prep tips for beginners? I would say there go to the frozen section there's a big myth around frozen foods especially frozen vegetables where many people think frozen isn't as nutritious as fresh whereas actually frozen is just as nutritious as fresh because during the freezing process they pick the vegetables right at its peak and they lock in those nutrients through freezing so you're getting all of those nutrients as you would in fresh vegetables and what's even better it's cheaper and you're less likely to waste food because you just toss it in the freezer sounds and looks because we're looking at some of your food looks very good you call yourself the ceo of adding and balance talk to us about the three color plate rule and what types of foods should we absolutely incorporate in our daily meals Yes, so my motto is definitely adding because on social media or in diet, co diet, cultural, diet culture overall, a lot of people say to restrict if you want to meet your health goals or if you want to lose weight. Whereas, you know, that might be, that might help you succeed in the short term, but that actually might cause more prob problems in the long term. Um, because, you know, you can develop an unhealthy relationship with food and you're more likely to binge on that food you're restricting. So I like it if you change your mindset to adding to your plate. Um, and when you add more to your plate, you know, you're going to feel a lot more satisfied. You're going to feel a lot more full. And so that's where I kind of incorporated the three color plate rule. So you have, for an example, just like a plate of chicken and rice. And I would say the overall color is white. 
But I like the three color plate rule because that allows you to add more nutrients to your plate. So maybe add some spinach, some tomatoes. Um, and you know, having more volume on your plate, you're just gonna feel a lot more satisfied. We appreciate you being a myth buster there. And we all love, of course, some budget friendly tips with prices skyrocketing due to inflation. How can we maintain an affordable and yet healthy diet? Because often it seems that, you know, the fresh vegetables and fruits tend to be uh, among the most expensive. Right, and so like I said before, always, you know, don't be afraid of the frozen section and the canned section as well. Canned uh, fruits and vegetables are very nutri nutritious. So when you can, it basically pre preserves all the nutrients. And I will say with canning, it might decrease some water soluble vitamins like vitamin C um, or some B vitamins, but it can also increase antioxidant content. So for an example, tomatoes, canned tomatoes actually has more lysopene, which is an antioxidant, um, than fresh tomatoes, which is really good for heart health. So what you're telling us is when you can, can. But I'm bummed. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Steph, thank you so much for joining our program this week. You can check out Steph Grasso, dietitian, for more healthy tips. Thanks so much, Steph. Thank you so much. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.